It's pretty exciting, you know, to see your son just doing different things. And uh, I, I, I just love that. I just think it's great. Look around the church. This is a good church. Right? I just look around and, uh, and I'm just grateful for it. You know that um, on Tuesday mornings, we get together as a staff and we do a prayer meeting. We just pray for the needs of the church, the things of the church, what's coming up. And uh, it was my turn to lead it on Tuesday morning. And so you're always racking your brains because you don't want to just do the same every time. And you want to bring a little bit of variety and a bit of difference into it. And so I just thought, you know, Paul prayed a lot of prayers in uh, the book, of, uh, in the Bible for the church. And so I found 10 different prayers that Paul prayed for the church. And uh, the first one was this. Pray that you and thank God for the people. And that was our first prayer. Thank God for the people. And to have this gratefulness. And so that's what we prayed. And I want to say as a senior pastor of Emerge, I'm grateful that you come to church. I'm grateful that you're here today. I'm grateful that you serve. I'm grateful that you help. I'm grateful that you invite people. I'm grateful that you call Emerge Church your home. Or if this is your first time here, that you've you come. I am just grateful and I thank God for you that God has entrusted us and the team here at Morayfield to pastor you. I, I love this church. I brag about you. Uh, lately, I mean, when we have a guest speaker, I'll, I'll go to Morayfield. You'll love that. All right? And I get in to come to Morayfield. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you, church. I'm grateful to God for giving us such a great church. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. This is good. This is good. So I've got a, a couple of announcements myself before we start. First of all, I want to say congratulations to Jade and Jeremy, right? They are with child, so uh, that's a fantastic thing, and I, I just think it's great. It makes and puts a smile on my face. One of the other things that we're doing today is today is Rachel Gordon's last uh, Sunday with us, right? So Rachel is also with child, but way more than uh, Jade, right? So she could be having a child any time. When I see her now, I think, oh my goodness, right? So uh, uh, she's, uh, she's not leaving the church. She's not going anywhere, but she's going to have a baby. And uh, she has served really, really well, right? She came on staff as, first of all, as Pastor Joe's PA, Right, way, way back. And she's just grown and uh, just taken on many, many responsibilities. At the time now, she's doing uh, creative. So she looks after the whole creative team. And she also looks after all the events that we do. And as a church, I promise you, we do a whole lot of different events. And so she's done the job with great uh, aplomb. What I want to say, she's done it with initiative and she's been someone that has come with solutions rather than problems. And that's a really good thing in a staff member. Someone who's actually, we could do this, we could do that. Pastor Mark, what do you think about this? Pastor Nina, how do you... And, and it was just easy working with her. And uh, so tonight we're going to say goodbye to her as an official sort of uh, kind of thing for tonight. So we're going to do that. And she's going to be doing communion, kind of like as her last official. And now she's still going to be at church. And in a few weeks' time, she'll be at church holding a little girl, right, which is going to be fantastic. But uh, we just want to honour people who are worthy of honour. You know, in the Philippians, uh, Paul says, I want to honour I'm, I'm gonna, this name is really hard to say. It's Epaphroditus, right? I want to honour him because he was a man worthy of honour. And Rachel has been a, a, a lady worthy of honour. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So if you can be there tonight, please be there. It's a night of honour. We're also going to do worship and prayer. And the thought that I have is that Jesus said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. We will talk a bit about that at the end of this sermon today. But what it is, is that like in Ezekiel, God appears and he says, has it got the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of an ox and the face of a lion? And it's, God can be what he needs to be. If I need God to be an eagle that can see over all things, then get what God can be for me. 
If I need God to be a man that can actually understand what I'm actually going through and understand pain, well, I've got Jesus because Jesus was God coming as a man. And we're going to look at all that and how it affects you. And so if you're going through something tonight or today or this week or you've got something that you're facing, make sure you're there tonight because tonight is going to give you a resource of God's presence in your life to be able to actually get through whatever it is that you're going through. So that's what we're on about tonight. So let us preach. Father, I thank you for the privilege of speaking your word, Father, to your people, O oh God. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the people in it, O oh God. I thank you, O oh Lord, that you have an agenda this morning. And so, Lord, let it be that you use me to bring about your agenda. Let people hear what you have to say, not what I have to say, O oh God. Use what I'm about to say to help and encourage, to, to convict, O oh God, to Father, Lord, to strengthen. We just ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you would know, our theme for this year is follow me and I will make you. And I started to think about the word follow and following. See, following, if you think about it, is, is a posture. It's something that you're doing. Following is, is, it involves connection. Following is not isolationist. It takes two groups or two people at least to follow. There has to be two. There has to be a connection. There's one person who's doing the leading, who's going somewhere, who's bringing or, or setting the direction, connected to someone else or a group that gives weight and regards and is obedient to the one that's doing the leading. So there's literally nothing individualistic about following. See, there's no following going on if you're the only one in the partnership. There is no partnership. If it's just you, then there is no partnership. There's no following going on. By the very definition, there has to be two people involved for following to go on. If, if you're just following and it's just you, you're on a walk. You're not actually following anyone. It's also not following if you're the one who's setting the direction or giving the instruction. So if you want to take control of your own life, then you're not following Jesus. You're following what you want to do. When you follow, you've got to take on what someone else is asking you to do. By its very definition, there has to be two parties involved if following is part of the equation. So Jesus saying to us, follow me and I will make you, is actually a master stroke. He is a genius, and I love seeing the genius of God. As you read the Word of God, you see His genius again and again and again. And our God is a genius. And this is genius because by asking us to follow Him, following Jesus makes me connected to Him. Instead of leaving us on our own, instead of just saying, you work it out, you kind of work it out, here's the Bible, you just work it out, just kind of do that. What he says is, no, follow me. He gives us a way to stay connected to him. I don't need to become disconnected because I follow him. I do what he asks and he leads me in the direction that he wants to take me. Another uh, important observation regarding following is that a direction is set. Right When you're following, the person is going that way, he's setting a direction. If he's going that way, he's setting a direction. So there is a direction that is set. So it's a saying, I'm going towards this, but I'm not going towards that. We've all followed someone when they said, oh, you know, we'll go to this place. I know where it is. You just follow me in the car. And for some reason, they decide to go through an orange light, right? And then they're, boom, they're out there, right? And then you're like, where did they go? Right? Has anyone else had that? Right? If you're being followed by someone in a good way, right? Not like the movies way, right? But if you're being followed by someone, right? Don't go through an orange light, right? Wait at that light. The person next to you doesn't want to get a picture of their car anytime soon, right? So, see what happens is that like you don't know where you're going. If you lose sight of the person that you're following, you just, where are they? Do they go left? And so they must have gone left. I think it's left. So you go left, but they went right. They went straight ahead. 
and all of a sudden you've lost, you become disconnected from the person that you're following. Right? Hopefully they've pulled over to the side and they're waiting for you again, which is smart if you've gone through an orange light. So this morning, I want to talk to people who at the moment are feeling a little bit disconnected. You're feeling a little bit disconnected. God, how do I follow? I, 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 I've endeavoured to follow you, but I've, I've kind of lost you. You've kind of gone a bit quick, or I've been a bit slow, or, or I wasn't paying attention at the right. I've just kind of lost you right now. You love God. You know God. You want to follow God. But right now, you're just feeling that little bit disconnected. I want to encourage you this morning. I want to say that God hasn't moved, right? I, I believe that God is waiting for you. He's waiting for you to reconnect. And at the end of this meeting today, we're going to do something that's going to help you just reconnect. And you'll find how very easy it is to reconnect from God because God doesn't move. He's pulled over waiting for you to reconnect. So I want to look at three reasons that we get disconnected. There's a lot of different reasons, but I just want to look at three reasons. The first reason is that we look back. We look back. Looking back disconnects you. Yet looking back is always a temptation when following Jesus because His calling is always asking you to leave something. If I'm following this way, I'm leaving what's over here. right? So if I look back, all of a sudden I lose disconnection from those that I'm trying to follow. I'm trying to follow Jesus, but I look back. I lose connection. If I were to try and preach to you like this today, just looking at the screen, very soon I would lose connection. I would lose connection with you all. I, I remember that uh, one time I was doing a video preach. Sometimes if I go away for a little while, I, I might preach uh, to the video and then we show the video on the Sunday. And Neil always does a fantastic job in, uh, in doing that. So we go into the uh, auditorium at Warner, and it's just Neil and myself. He's on the camera, and he's doing things, making sure the sound works, all these different things, doing a great job, right? And then one day, Neil got a phone call. And so I'm preaching away, going like this, and Neil doesn't want to, like, you know, hello, Julie, how are you? Sorry, I'm doing this. You know, and all you hear is Neil speaking in the background. So he does what is wise, and he goes, I'll quickly just take this phone call, and I'll go out the side and, and take the phone call. And so I'm preaching away, and Neil does that. I kind of realize what's going on. And all of a sudden, he's out of the room, and there's no one in the room. And all I've got is a camera. And, and I just got all discombobulated. I just got all confused. I, I didn't know what I was really doing. And we had to actually just do it again. Right? I just said, Neil, never leave again. All right? Like, you know, like, so he was doing the right thing. But in the end, it disconnected me from people. I needed at least one person that I can connect to. So looking back disconnects you. When you're taking a next step in following Jesus, you're always going to leave something behind. You know, I got married 28 years ago. I left things behind. I could no longer do as I please. Right? That is the greatest thing about being single. You can do what you want when you want. Right? But when you get married, every decision you make now affects someone else. When I was single... I could keep my bedroom how I wanted, right? I didn't have to care. And I literally had two months worth of clothes, enough jocks to last two months, and I would just throw them everywhere, all my clothes for two months, and then every two months I'd get this whole thing, and I'd go to the laundromat and take up all six washing machines, right, in the laundromat and just do my washing all in one day, right? I didn't wash my sheets in maybe a year, right? Because, And you know what? It was my bedroom. I'm allowed to do that. I can do that, right? Don't judge me, right? It's my bedroom. And that's what can happen when you're single. You can do what you want. Anyone else can think you're disgusting, but it doesn't matter, right? I'm okay. I'm allowed to do that. But imagine if I live like that now, right? It's no longer just my bedroom. Nina lives in that bedroom. And it's kind of, you've never had two more opposite people. Right? Nina probably thinks this is already untidy and we'll just move that over here. Right? Like, it's just like, it's just, she's very tidy. 
So I've got about, you know, like a few hours grace for any sense of clothing left in my uh, bedroom, right? So, and that, so, but you know what? When Nina goes to Adelaide, I don't do anything. I don't make the bed, right? I don't wash anything. I don't do it. It's awesome, right? Then my daughters judge me, right? See, the thing is, when you're following someone, when you leave something, then you always have to see it. There's always something that you leave behind. Every time you take a step in your walk with God in following Jesus, you leave something to go to where Jesus is. Is leading to you, leading you to. Maybe you need to leave an attitude, right? Maybe you have an attitude. I'm, I, uh, that that you're better than everyone else. Well, well, you're not. You leave an arrogant attitude behind. Let there come a humility. Leave that behind. Jesus doesn't want arrogance in the people that are following him. Maybe there's a behaviour. Maybe that when you've got in trouble in the past, you've you kind of told a bit of a lie to kind of cover up what it is that, that someone may be upset with you. So you told a bit of a lie. And so, but Jesus said, if you're following me, I, I, don't, I don't want that. I'm going to leave that behavior behind. Maybe there was a right that you have. Someone did do the wrong thing to you. Someone did uh, do terrible things to you. And you almost have a right to hold on to that unforgiveness. But Jesus said, no, I want you to lay down that right because I'm, I'm taking you somewhere. See, there's something we've always got to leave behind. Maybe you've got to leave behind a relationship, that this relationship is having more effect on you in taking you away from the things of God than where it's bringing you towards the things of God. See, I, I don't know what it is, but in your walk with God, there's always going to be something that God's going to say, leave it behind. Leave it behind, an attitude, a right, a behavior, a relationship. Leave those things behind if they're not helping you. Because following Jesus is an action. It's not an intent. Following Jesus is an action. Wanting to follow Jesus is different to actually following Jesus. You have to move. And without some form of action... You eventually become disconnected. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Now, if you think about it, the second most quoted verse in the Bible would be Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Many of you would have heard a number of sermons. Many of you would have memorized the scripture. Many of you have have it written somewhere because it is a great verse because it tells us a lot about how God thinks. Jeremiah 29 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. When God speaks and thinks about you, He thinks and speaks about the future you. He doesn't speak about the past you. He doesn't even speak to you about the now you. He speaks about the future you. Any prophetic word that you have over you is about His desire for who you are becoming and what He has for you. It's really not about what you are now other than how you can overcome those negative aspects. Every prophetic word you receive, you have always about your future. God has always done this. Abraham is called the father of many nations, even when he hasn't even got one child and it seems too late. Moses is called the deliverer of the people when he's living in exile in the desert, running away from his mistakes. David is called the anointed king when his own father doesn't even remember that he's about, doesn't even call him in, and he's just actually just looking after sheep in the, in the, in the back blocks. Gideon is called a mighty man of valor when he's part of the smallest family of the smallest tribe of significance in all of Israel. Paul is chosen. I love this. Paul is called a chosen instrument to carry God's name to the Gentiles when he's on the way to Damascus to kill Christians. That's the first words that are spoken over Paul. Not about his past, not condemnatory of all the things that he's done. It's about what God has for him. Follow me, Paul, and I'm going to make you I'm going to make you a chosen instrument to carry God's name to the Gentiles. 
These people and many other people in the Bible were described as God saw them to be, not as they were and definitely not as they had been. See, we've got to learn from your past. And you should learn from your past. That just makes sense. But learning from the past is actually about moving you forward. See, you don't, you don't want to get stuck in the past. You have to learn from it. And so you don't make the same mistakes so that your future is made. So in the past, yes, you did fail. I, can, I guarantee you there'd be some terrible sins if we started talking about the sins and the shameful things that we've done. Yes, you did sin. Yes, you did give up. Yes, people did use you. Yes, people did terrible things to you. Yes, you didn't have it as easy as other people have had it. But stop looking back with those things as an anchor that stop you from going forward and actually following Jesus. Looking back with an attitude to grow into your future is actually wise. But looking back with an attitude of longing or regret only leads to trouble. Many people have problems today because they can't let go of what happened to them yesterday. Proper looking back, the way God wants us to look back, is designed to propel you into the future, not just root you into a spot. Even the rear vision mirror of a car is positioned in a place where I must look forward and is purposely designed small because I'm not supposed to be concentrating on that. I'm supposed to be concentrated on where I'm going. And that rear vision mirror gives me just that little bit so I know when there's trouble coming or to move over to the left because an ambulance is coming through. It's there to help me with my future. It's there to help me to see where I'm going. It's not something I'm supposed to look at. It's something I'm supposed to glance at. You know, when God rescued Lot in the book of Genesis, right at the, at the beginning there, he rescued Lot because he was going to kind of bring judgment upon the, uh, the land of Sodom. And he charged him, he says, don't look back. He says, don't look back. And so what happens, we see in the story that Lot's wife did look back. And right there, she became a pillar of salt. And that's what does happen when you start looking back. You start looking back and you get stuck. And she got disconnected from God. She looked at where she came from and because of that she couldn't go forward. And that's what happens when you live looking back, you get stuck. See, I believe that she looked with a longing, with a lack of trust that what God was taking her to is better. Do you understand that? When Jesus is saying, follow me, it may look like it's hard. It may look like there's obstacles. It may look like what he's asking you to do is too hard. But it's actually much better. And where he's taking you, you've got to trust him. The Israelites looked back to Egypt. They didn't like the realities of pushing through what God had for them. And they cried out when they're in the wilderness, oh, that we had the leeks and garlics of Egypt. It does sound good though, leeks and garlics of Egypt. See, but really, to be honest, they make up a fantasy about what the past was, about how good their lives were in Egypt. They complain saying the leeks and the garlics of Egypt were better than dying here in the wilderness. But that was actually a fantasy. Back in Egypt, they were had been saved from a and delivered from an evil pharaoh who beat them regularly and made them make bricks without straw. That was the reality. They were starving. The leeks and garlics of Egypt was a fantasy. It was only in the mind how good the past was. It wasn't reality. And many times looking back is actually a fantasy. It's not reality. You create in your mind a past that isn't actually true. When Israelites were complaining about God and looking back, it demonstrated a lack of trust in God. God wants to kill us in the wilderness. They didn't look forward to the promise. They looked back. They, they didn't want a faith walk. They wanted to walk by sight. But the Christian walk is not a sight walk. And this is crucial to following God. It's by faith, not by sight. I have to trust God 
that he's leading me into a good place and that the promised land is a wonderful place. See, we want everything mapped out. Guarantees of success. No troubles on any side. But there's no faith in that. There's no faith in that. When you look back without the future in mind, you glorify the past and become tempted to settle and not fulfill all that God has for you. And that disconnects us. Jesus called us to look forward. He said to his disciples, leave your nets and come follow me. You used to fish for fish. I'm now going to make you fishers of men. God wants to take us into a place of promise, a promised land. He wants to make us into what was ever originally designed for us. Paul said, I forget what is behind and I press on in my calling to serve Christ. And my question to you this morning is, are you pressing on? Are you moving forward? Are you, are you getting through the obstacles to get to where God is asking you to go? Reason number two is disappointment. Disappointment disconnects us. Discouragement disconnects us. Setbacks disconnect us. And we've all felt like this every now and again. You just can't be bothered. You tried. You tried faith. You tried the church, but it didn't work. You prayed. Your prayer wasn't answered. You, you went and served somewhere, but you weren't even appreciated. So you stop. And you sit down and you take a breather. And to be honest, I would say that in places that's okay. I definitely believe that there are some rest stops in our journey with Jesus. Jesus isn't just going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus knows that we need some rest. You know, in God's design, he designed a, a day off. And I want to say to you, if you work seven days a week, I want to say you are better than God. Because God needed a rest. God worked six days and designed it so that you could work for a long time that, that you would have a Sabbath. And I believe that we should have a day. I'm not talking in a way that maybe uh, the Jewish faith uh, looks at the Sabbath. But I, I believe that we need to take a Sabbath. We need to have one day a week where we're not doing the thing that we gain our income from. And I believe it's important. And I believe that if you don't take it, God eventually will. Right? You'll get sick, something will happen, and you won't be able to have your Sabbath. So be wise and take your Sabbath. I, I, I think it's funny. We all know and we all believe the Ten Commandments, and we know that there's consequence for it, but somehow we think there's not a consequence for breaking the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for us, the Bible says. It's not for God, and God designed it, but that's a whole other sermon, and that's not in my notes. So someone here must be needing to hear that. So you sit down. And you take a breather. But there is a time to get up again. There's a time to get up again from your rest. Rest time is over. Hebrews 6 says this. We are confident that you are meant for better things that come with salvation. So salvation isn't it. We're going to give an altar call at the end of this service. We're going to ask that you give your life to Christ. And that is fantastic. That's what it's about. But it's not just about getting into heaven there's things that come with salvation, better things. For God is not unfair. He will not forget how hard you've worked for Him and how you've shown love to Him by caring for other Christians. When you look out for each other, you're actually showing love to God, the Bible says here, as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep right on loving others as life, as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. And here's a great definition of disconnection. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and their patience. See, the thing is, is that God says, hey, look, I know you got disappointed. I know there was a setback. I know you might have taken a break, but there's a time to get on. I've seen what you've done, but keep on going because as you come away, what happens? You sit there and you start to think about yourself and you get disconnected. What are my needs? I want to say the greatest way to get your needs met is to meet the needs of other people. 
That is always the way. If God can get through you, God will get to you. You need compassion, you be compassionate. Right? There's all these different things, just principles of the, of the word. And so what happens is that like, if I pull away, when I was hurt, I had a setback, there was this disappointment. I pull away and I make it about my kingdom. I make it about me. And all of a sudden I become spiritually dull and indifferent. When you're serving, when you're helping and loving one another, all of a sudden you become spiritually aware, you become spiritually hopeful about what God is doing. God's promises are one of the better things that come with salvation. See, a promise of God, though, is going to be contended for. 1 Peter tells us that God's promises are given to us that we could access heaven for our lives. So if I just want to do something, I can do it. I've got my skills, I've got my intellect, I've got my abilities, and I can just go and do that. I'm capable of doing it. But when God asks me to do something, it's almost always something that I can't do. It's something that I need more than just my skills, abilities, and talents to do. And so what happens is God says, I'll come. He gives me a promise, and I hang on to that. And the Bible says a promise is a sword, and I can fight the enemy and the accusations and the obstacles because God has given me a promise. You want to see heaven activated in your life? Get a promise from God and then start to live it out, and you'll see, man, I am staying connected. And that's why I speak so often about getting a life word from God. A word that makes a difference in your life, whether you're 8 or whether you're 108, that God is connecting to you through that word. Reason number three, and I think this is an interesting reason. You just lose the care factor. I think right now, more than any other time in history, it's actually easier to lose sight of why your faith matters of why following Jesus is even actually important. There are more distractions than ever. If you think just 80, 100 years ago, life was pretty simple. This is general statements. But generally, the majority of people stayed pretty much where they lived. They worked when it was light and stayed home when it was dark. Travel really wasn't a thing. Their entertainment considered of maybe listening to the radio or going to a dance or a pub or to the football or cricket on the weekends. Even when TV eventually came along, there were just four channels. And if you lived in a country, just one. Women stayed mainly at home to look after the family and fathers went to work and came home. The work week was pretty much Monday to Friday. Saturday was to do jobs and Sunday was for church and family. In many ways, it was much simpler being a Christian back all those years ago. It was definitely in, easier to pastor a church, I want to say. In 2024, just, you know, just 80, 100 years difference, it's so different. 25% of the dwellings of houses are just one person. So when you drive home today, one of every four houses has just got a single occupant in that house. 30% of families are blended. Only 33% of families, listen to this, 33% of families are mum, dad with kids. Right? So we live in a very different society. Work is every day now. I don't, I'm, I'm guessing it will be under 50% of people who just do a kind of Monday to Friday, 37, 40 hour week. The average mortgage is 572000 and the average house in Queensland costs $870,000. So it's almost impossible for a, a, a family to survive with just one person working. Choice and options are king. There's every type of restaurant, every type of sport. There used to be four TV channels. Now on my phone, I've got 10 streaming things. Right, where I can watch something. Ten! Maybe I'm addicted. Uh, we are going to do... No, I won't go there. All right. Life has never been easier, but yet, or been made to be easier, but yet it's harder and busier than ever. There's all these distractions. 
There's all these things that, that garner my time and my, my effort and, and what I'm thinking about, what I'm praying for. There's all these things that I, that I have to do. We think about social media and all the things that it puts up there. I should be doing this and someone else is doing that and, and all this stuff's going on and, and my life is just distracted everywhere. I believe it's harder to follow Jesus now than it ever has been in history. Maybe the band could come. Mark 4.18 says this. And the others, this is Jesus speaking and explaining the parable of the sower. He's talking about the seed that was thrown amongst the thorns. And he goes, and others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. I believe we are living in the thorniest time in history. Right now, more than any other time, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Now this is one of the things, I've read this scripture many times. I've preached on this scripture many times. It's a concept I've always believed in, that not going after the things of this world, not desiring riches, not, it's just, it doesn't work. But then I read it this time, and it says it proves unfruitful. So what happens is that you go after it. You go after the cares of this world. You go after riches. You, you go after uh, the desire for other things. You go after all that. But then what happens is it makes your faith like it doesn't work. Like, I, I tried church. I, I tried going there, but it, it didn't work. I, but, but what happens is that it really wasn't what you were following. You were still following the cares of this world. You're still following the desire for riches. You're still following the desire for other things. But you're just adding Christianity. I'm going to try this. Like you tried that other thing, like you tried going to the gym or like you tried this other sort of thing or this other self-help thing. You've taken it as a self-help way to make your kingdom better, to make your kingdom greater. Whereas it says, no, put aside your kingdom, leave your nets, leave everything that you've trusted in and all of a sudden the kingdom works. All of a sudden he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else is added to you. And so what happens is that like if you're using the kingdom as a self-help, as a five steps to get what it is, then I want to say it will prove unfruitful. It won't be what it is actually designed to be. But in giving your life to Christ, in saying, I die to self, and what does the Bible say? If anyone is a follower of me, let him deny himself. We don't like that, right? No, no, I want to give myself. No, I don't want to deny myself. I need my needs met, Jesus. You know what I mean? My needs, Jesus. And so we look back at that and he's going, but I've got so much more. I've got so much more. Now, one of the benefits for me is that I've done it. And so I can look back and say, hey, I see it's true. It's real. 40 years ago, I came completely broken in every way to Jesus. And I tried to follow Jesus from that day. I made lots of mistakes and lots of crazy things, did all sorts of things. I'm way from perfect, right? And that, but I'm following Jesus. And the kingdom has given me everything that I need. The kingdom has given me my life. See, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And the world tells you, you need this, and you need that, and you should be doing this, and you should be having that, and if you haven't got that, you shouldn't be happy. But Jesus said, I've overcome the world. And when the world gets too strong and you think, I should be having this, or, or why haven't I got that, and, and, and desire, and all those things try and take you away, then what happens? You go, Jesus gives me everything that I need. I have overcome the world. But I want to say this. I want to be gracious. 
Because God understands. God understands that it's hard right now. The Holy Spirit understands that it's, that it's difficult, that, that you have far more temptations than ever in history before. We have access to so much information, access to so much. God understands. But what happens is that He gives us things like communion every week where we can remember Jesus. Get back to the fact that it's Jesus. We have preaching, we have worship. And we're going to come into a time of worship right now because worship connects us. Worship is a place where we get connected. The Bible says that it builds a habitation in the praise and worship of His people. So your praise goes up and His presence comes down. Your praise comes up and His presence comes down. Now what it is, is that God's present here all the time. He's not like on Morayfield Road and you start praising, oh, what's that? I'll come running over here. Does it make sense? God's here already. What happens is that we tune in. Worship tunes you in. It's not God going, oh, there's worship, I'll come down now. I tune in. Right now, there's all sorts of radio stations. You could be listening to the races today. Right now, just get the right tuning. Right? You could be listening to worship music or whatever. You could listen to whatever, just tune in. It's all here. It's about tuning in. Worship tunes you in to the presence of God. And see, once you have His presence, it actually does feel that hunger and that desire and cures the looking back and makes it easier to just want to follow. It makes it easier to just want to follow because I now see God for who He is. And when we see God and we experience the presence of God, nothing on earth compares to Him. There's no feeling you have, nothing you can have that actually compares to Jesus Christ and His presence. So I want you to stand right now. I want the band to come. I want you just to close your eyes. Oh, Jesus. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Let his presence just woo you. practice His presence this morning. of God. It's a resource today. It's time to reconnect. It's time to hear His voice afresh calling you, coming to you. Set aside your disappointments. Stop looking back. 
understand it's important to go after Him. Order your desire be for the kingdom. Put His kingdom first. Jesus. 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 you, oh God. We honor you. Praise you, oh God. Worship you, oh God. You're wonderful, oh God. about the incense. The incense was in the temple because the temple was a place of sacrifice. Every day they would sacrifice hundreds and sometimes even thousands of animals. And they would do that in a burnt offering. So you can imagine the stench that was in that place of sacrifice. But all of a sudden that incense was burned. And that incense would overcome the sacrifice. And there's going to be sacrifices in serving and following Jesus. There's going to be things that you've got to leave behind. There's got to be desires that you've got to put aside. There's got to be trust that you've got to have when you feel like just kind of not trusting. And all of a sudden, the incense of worship comes in and it makes the sacrifice worthy. It makes the sacrifice being able to be able to be tolerable, that you're able to do it. And then plant incense. That's what people smelt when they went into the temple. It wasn't the sacrifice, it was the incense. So let your worship today arise as incense towards God, overcoming the areas of sacrifice. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day Oh, bring connection. You 
worthy, God. Bring connection. Let's connect in this atmosphere. Some of you being reminded of words. Some of you being reminded of the goodness of God. He's not just a great God, He's a good God. Let's just raise one hand to heaven. Call on Him. Surrender. Surrender some of those rights. Surrender some of those desires. Surrender some of those disappointments and setbacks. where we've minimized it, where we haven't used it. So if you want to have a little bit of a picture into my prayer life, is to try and create moments where His presence is real. Where no matter what it is that I'm facing, no matter what it is decisions I need to make, I know that God is with me. Jesus says, better I go so I can send to you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be with you in your bedroom, in your car, as you go for a walk, in your lounge room, in your office. It's going to make time. 
And His presence is a resource. If you're feeling disconnected, just put on some music. Put on something that draws you into His presence. See, we don't take hold of the resource often enough. Yet it's given to us. It's, it's what's been the strength or, and no, no sense of boasting. But it's what I've wanted. It's what I've gone for. It's what I've asked of God. Because when I go out, I want to know that I'm not going out alone. When I have to make a decision, I, I want to know that I'm not just making a decision based on what seems worldly wise. doesn't mean I'm not going to make mistakes. doesn't mean I'm not going to do everything right. But what it does mean is that God is with me. And to know that you're not alone, that's powerful. That's His peace. That's how He's overcome the world. He doesn't overcome the world by just giving you something else. He overcomes the world by giving you Himself. And sometimes we just don't take enough of it. And I think with all the different ways in which we can listen to music now, all sorts of different music, they'll just woo us. Just woo us into His presence. Say, I'm with you. You're going to make it. God's on your side. You're not alone. Is there anything that's too difficult for me? It's the presence of God. And when I stay connected to Him, I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to listen to what it is that He's asking me to do. And I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to where He's taking me on my journey which is different to your journey. And Jesus has specific words that are just for you. It's not all the same. But learn His presence. Learn to stay connected. You know, you may not be ever come to this church before. You may not be a Christian this morning. But you can sense the presence of God. Because you don't have to be a Christian to sense His presence. The Bible says that He writes eternity on your heart. So whenever eternity and you come into an atmosphere where God is present and people are sensing His presence, all of a sudden that does something in your spirit. I came to church the first time, had no idea of the presence of God, but I sensed something in here. I didn't understand it here, but in my gut. God is dealing with you right now. And you know you need to get right with God. You know you're not right with Him. That's you this morning. Take that first step and say, Jesus, I want to connect with you. If you're disconnected from Jesus this morning, I want to pray with you right now. Can you raise your hand? Is there anyone as I look over this group of people here this morning? As I look over, thank you. One young man, I'll pray for you after. Anyone else? Amen. One lady over here. One young lady over here. Right now. Make that connection with him. Anyone else? Anyone else? Jesus. His presence is still here. God condemns no one. Didn't come here to condemn you. He comes in here to draw you. You know God likes you. Sometimes we think God, He's God, so He has to put up with us. But He actually likes you. He actually likes her. When you take the time and just draw Him into your life, He's He's got a smile on his face. It's not like, oh man, I haven't really got time for that. He's not a man. He's God. He loves you. He just loves you. He just loves you. Father, you see these people who have raised their hands this morning. Father, Lord, let them right now just sense your love. Let them sense your forgiveness. Father, Lord, let you see their posture of desire 
and of direction towards you. And I pray, God, honour that. Help them. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if that was you, please, I'll be at the front. Love to just pray with you. If that was you, put up your hand. I'd love to pray.